So thanks uh, to Eckhart for me and uh, the others for the invitation. I'm very happy to be able to present um, this uh, paper with uh, with you. Um, the first the first thing that um, motivated this paper was uh, all the excitement that seems to be going around. Uh, in, in political economy about this idea of uh, growth model. So I wanted to discuss these uh, ideas of growth models, um, but from the perspective of political economy, not from the perspective of uh, economics uh, strictly and not um, post collision economics, which is, I think, what uh, Eckhart is going to be doing in, in his presentation. Um, a few years ago, uh, Bakar and Pontesson presented a paper which some people think is a seminal article uh, leading to rethinking political economy or transform the way political economy is, uh, comparative political economy is, is, is done. Uh, this, and, and this is the so-called growth model perspective, sometimes growth model approach, but I stick to the growth model perspective denomination. Uh, it started as something relatively modest, that was to introduce um, demand-side macroeconomics in comparative political economy, comparative capitalism, in order to uh, distinguish to itself, themselves from uh, well, the approach, approach of the Holland um, Soss case, which is more based in uh, neo keynesian type of supply-side microeconomics. But uh, as, as I've said, it, it's, it's actually become some sort of... Uh, attempt to rethink, transform uh, comparative political economy. So um, the first question we could ask is, uh, well, what is a growth model, by the way? Uh, you will not find a definition in the uh, so-called seminal article of Baccarat and Pontusson. Um, and if you look at a more recent publication, a book uh, edited by uh, Blythe, Baccaro, Pontusson uh, this year, you won't find a precise definition either. You've got a mere clarification and they say that they use the term growth model in a descriptive sense in order to distinguish models which are based in countries, meaning um, based on uh, um, exports or whose growth is based on exports or on uh, domestic consumption or something else. Uh, and the question, uh, you find all the terms in the literature, such as growth regime, for instance, and you might ask yourself, is it the same as a growth regime? And what, what do those uh, things uh, actually uh, mean? Actually, I checked the literature and I found, uh, well, a, a, a contribution I know, which is little known, um, which is probably the clearest exposition of what the growth model are. Uh, and that was written by somebody who's uh, passed away uh, a couple of years ago, Michel Fresnay, uh, who's written sometimes in collaboration with Robert Boyer in the 1990s and, and 2000. And in fact, when you look closely what Michel Fresnay had written, you see that a large part of the current political economy literature on the growth models actually look like some sort of uh, version, some, most of them, more often than not, a simplified version of uh, the conceptual framework that Michel Fresnay had, had elaborated in, 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 this, uh, in his uh, uh, contributions. So actually to understand what growth models are, it's better to start with uh, the contribution of Michel Fresnay and to look in vain uh, for a, a precise or even a, a not so precise definition in the current literature because you won't find any. Uh, and it's also useful, and I'm, I'll be very brief about that because I suppose most of you or some of you at least are vaguely familiar with those. Uh, it's also, also useful to look at the concepts of the original, the original concept, sorry, of the um, uh, French regulation theory, uh, because actually the work of Fresnay uh, has, has got a, uh, its origins there. Um, so the, very quickly, uh, the basic uh, regulation concepts, you've got uh, first the concept of an accumulation regime, which you may call a growth regime because they sort of dropped the, the denomination accumulation because it was too, too you know, Marxist oriented properly. Growth is more acceptable as, uh, as a term. And this is a, a set of regularities uh, ensuring a general and relatively coherent progression of capital accumulation. The second uh, type uh, set of concepts are the five institutional forms, which are, as, as it says, institutions really like money, the wage labor nexus, forms of competition, international regime, and the forms of the state. So all these institutions actually uh, um, um, 
audience and, and support the accumulation regime. And the, the, the last uh, um, concept is the one of the mode of regulation itself, which is like a, a, a specification, if you wish, of the way institutional reforms and the accumulation regime um, uh, interact. Um, so, uh, and this comes to uh, uh, a definition, you will find the definition of a growth model in, in the regulation uh, contributions. And it means two things. The first thing it means is, of course, what economists understand when you say growth model. They understand a set, a formal model, a set of equations describing the economy or analyzing the economy. And this is a notion which you find in uh, very early contributions in the 1980s of Boyer, Boyer and Petit, for instance. Uh, and, and up until uh, the 2020s, you can find contributions uh, using these formalizations as well. Uh, and, and you will even find a definition of what is a growth model in this, uh, and that's a second, um, uh, second definition I, I was um, uh, mentioning. Um, a, a growth model would be the interaction between a productivity regime and a demand regime. So you could say, and those are the equations which you may find uh, in, in, in represented graphically here in this. In, in, in this figure. So the growth model would be some sort of the uh, formal equivalent of the notions of growth regime or accumulation regime, which I had uh, uh, mentioned uh, um, uh, previously. So um, going to Michel Fresnay. Uh, Michel Fresnay uh, did his work uh, in the framework of a network uh, focused on the automobile industry. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary network which he funded um, and which is still active nowadays and uh, specialized in the automobile industry. Uh, and it's, with, it's mostly a micro meso approach focused on the firm and of course on the industry, the automobile industry. And the central concept of the Jean Pizat and Michel Fresnay's uh, work was that of productive models. And you will find those ideas exposed in a book uh, edited by Boyer and Fresnay about um, 20 years ago already. Uh, the Productive Models is probably the, um, the most well-known publication, but you've got many, many publications because the, the, the network is actually quite um, uh, substantial. The number of people is actually quite, quite large. And Fresnay went from the concept of productive model to that of a growth model. And this is, of course, what interests us mostly today. Um, a fundamental assumption, which is common to this idea, this notion of productive model and to that of growth model, is that actors act and interact when they have to face a common stake from which they cannot escape as a, uh, a collective actor. Focusing on firms in the automobile industry, uh, the major stake uh, has, has been identified as profitability. So, uh, and, and the, the related notion of profit strategies to explain what firms were doing in this in that um, uh, sector, uh, the, the, this concept was derived from there. So you've got the stake and you've got the strategy. Uh, but soon, of course, when they investigated this uh, uh, automobile industry, they discovered that uh, the conditions for success of the automobile firms were actually hinging on uh, some macro level determinants like, you know, the institutions governing the employment relation, uh, the credit relation, uh, the income distribution, etc., and so on and so forth. So that actually uh, it was necessary in order to understand the micro and meso level to take into account uh, the influence of the macro slash societal uh, uh, approach, which, of course, led uh, Michel Fresnay uh, to try to uh, develop the equivalent of the productive model at the micro level, to, to develop the equivalent at the macro uh, level, and this is why he tried to uh, develop the, 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 the notion of growth model. And of course, he used the same, um, let's say, strategy, research strategy, than the one he used at the micro meso level, so he looked for the common stake. And the common stake was uh, uh, taken to be growth, precisely, uh, for a, two reasons, really, because it would satisfy the objective of sovereignty with vis-a-vis -vis the other nations. The nation has got to grow in order to stay sovereign. And uh, the other uh, um, motivation was that uh, it would, uh, growth would ensure the stability of the international, internal uh, 
the national compromise, societal compromise or political compromise. And since the stake is growth, uh, same the, the profit strategy at the micro or meso level was uh, the equivalent of a macro uh, level strategy that would be a growth strategy. And the strategy would be the choice of a source of growth and the source of growth could be domestic consumption, investment or net exports. Actually, uh, they first tried when they say the dates, because sometimes Fresnay is working in, uh, has work, had worked as, uh, in, in collaboration with Robert um, Boyer, um, but I mean, the, the main in, in impetus was given by Fresnay. Uh, they first tried uh, to find a concept of growth mode, but they ditched it very soon because it mixed uh, the source of growth, consumption, investment, blah, 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 with income distribution. So they favored in start, instead. Um, this idea of a growth model separated from the idea of, of a growth uh, strategy. And then you will find in Fresnay's work uh, a definition of what a growth model is, and this is a quote directly from uh, one of the um, um, publications of, uh, of Michel Fresnay. A growth model is a national configuration in which the actors, having been led by external conditions and internal conditions, to favour one of the sources of growth in order to drive the others respond in a coherent manner to the requirements of this strategy, thanks to political compromise on the types of production and productivity to be favoured, on the form of distribution of national income to be set up, and on the regulation to be ensured between the production and the distribution. And this figure here is a, a graphical representation of what a growth model is, which is, as you can see, quite um, sophisticated uh, uh, theoretical construction, where you have requirements of a growth strategy, which influence the uh, national uh, compromise. And this gives rise to contradictions and a dynamics which feeds back into uh, the uh, possibility of uh, have, uh, achieving actually uh, a growth strategy. So you can see that this represents some sort of dynamic uh, equilibrium, uh, which has got as its center this national uh, compromise. Now, let me uh, dedicate the, uh, the, the, the second half of my uh, uh, presentation to uh, the exposition of what I think is problematic with this notion of growth models. So I, I start with uh, the idea that um, um, actually uh, the, um, the sources of growth are determined by a simple look at uh, the national accounting uh, uh, equation, overlooking one of these elements. And the overlooked element is uh, G, the um, um, public expenditure. Actually, uh, when I say it's overlooked, it's not really uh, true. Uh, it certainly is overlooked in the recent growth model perspective literature that I was mentioning in the introduction. Fresnay's work actually uh, is, 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 well, is, is not really writing about it, but is, is, uh, is, uh, is at least is sometimes mentioning it, but not giving it very much of, an, of, of a role to play in, in the growth model. Also interesting is the fact that um, Fresnay has, has uh, pointed uh, to the possibility of an investment-based strategy, which is something that you will not find in 99% of the recent uh, growth model perspective literature. So the recent literature has ignored not only G, but mostly for most of the authors as well, has ignored I as well. Um, so why, the question is, uh, why is it overlooked? Why couldn't G not be a source of growth? I mean, public expenditure is not something which is simply, you know, some sort of uh, failed expenditure. Uh, it doesn't matter not, uh, only for effective demand management purposes, but it could also be a driver of long run growth. It could be public infrastructure, public education, health, R&D, large scale technological pro uh, projects, etc. And uh, ironically, uh, mainstream uh, uh, endogenous growth literature has actually uh, paid a great deal of attention to uh, precisely these, uh, these, uh, these effects. <clears throat> 
And that my, my assumption is that uh, uh, the, um, the, the neglect of public expenditure is actually the consequence of the origins of the growth model notion in the productive model, which is mostly a, a you know, micro um, business. Second uh, problem I see with uh, growth, this growth model um, uh, idea is that the notion of growth strategy, which is important uh, with Fresne and not with some authors of the recent uh, growth model perspective, is that actually it's a strategy which is not really a strategy because there is no strategist. There is no actor uh, really that is devising this strategy. Uh, first, you could say that, um, remember that uh, I introduced the, the notion of Fresne by saying that he thought that it could be uh, the result of a, a search for sovereignty. Actually, there is an interesting text by Branko Milanovic from the early 2000s when you say, well, actually, you can have a, a trade-off between growth and sovereignty. So the two actually don't go uh, always hand in hand. And he says, he gives the he gave recently the example to compare Belgium to North Korea, for instance. North Korea is very sovereign and not very much, um, you know, not not growing very much. Uh, on the other hand, um, Belgium is very rich, uh, but not not sovereign at all, really. Um, so the idea of that growth and sovereignty would go hand in hand is not as obvious as it, as it would seem. Um, second, uh, the problem of the implementation of the strategy. Uh, Fresno uh, uh, speaks of the spoke of the coherence of the means employed and the compatibility of the means between them. Uh, the question is, uh, how does that come about? Uh, you know, how, how, how is the strategy devised? Other things, uh, in the French regulation theory, there is one element which is important, which is uh, that nobody should be or is supposed to be in charge of the stability of the system. And the stability of the system, or at least the, the achievability of the strategy, is something which should be of a paramount importance in, in a setup which has got this idea of growth strategy at its, uh, at its core. Um, the, the, the question of the emergence of the strategy, you, we saw in the figure how those things were actually a dynamical, dynamic um, um, representation with, you know, feedbacks and, and so on. But I mean, we, this doesn't explain really how the strategy is supposed to emerge. Is it a choice, a political choice? Is it the result of contradictions uh, um, among existing institutional forms? Is it a political compromise? Is it some sort of historical fact upon which uh, the, um, the economist or the political economist hasn't got much to say? This is not really clear. Uh, not, uh, although, I mean, Michel Fresnay is very intellectually honest in, in, in his presentations and the limitations of his approach and so on and so forth. But this fact is not really cleared in, in, in his contributions. Um, and the strategy is something which is important because in the growth model figure, which I've shown before, taken from Fresne, uh, actually the strategy is commanding the establishment of the compromise and the compromise is central to the existence of the growth model. Third uh, problem, uh, precisely the compromise. Uh, the compromise is at the center, is a necessary condition for the existence of a growth model, but it is non-theorized. Uh, and, and I think this is a big problem. It, if, if a notion which is that important for the very concept, the very notion of the growth model, that should be something that should be given a, a great deal of attention uh, on the theory side. Uh, even the common stake, which is central in the macro level of uh, theoretical construction, nothing is really said about how the compromise uh, uh, is, is defined in relation with this common stake. Um, the, 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 if, you, if you take into account that uh, we've got a differentiated society in social groups, classes, uh, workers versus capital owners and so on and so forth, uh, um, how could growth be defined uh, as a compromise by those conflicting social groups in society. You could say, well, homotetic growth is going to make everybody happy, but homotetic growth is going to preserve the status quo. And if you believe in political economy terms, it could be that some agents may have an interest in questioning the status quo. So, I mean, even, even a growth that would, you know, preserve the relative position would be something that could be questioned by some agents. 
Also, uh, the choice of the source of growth, which is the result of the growth strategy after all, uh, is something which is not neutral from the point of view of the distribution of political power, from the point of view of societal um, uh, importance, or from the point of view of economic resources, income distribution, and so on and so forth. So this should be also uh, theorized, or, or at least discussed in theoretical terms, uh, in the elaboration of the growth model uh, concept. Um, and also, um, in the French regulation theory, the institutional reforms are very important, and uh, you could ask yourself what types of institutions, what types of policies would result from precisely the confrontation of the points of view or interests of the different uh, agents in, in this society, uh, and how does it interact with or define the, the growth model itself? Um, I explain in more details, I haven't got time now, I explain more details in my uh, paper how this question I think is neutralized uh, in, in, the, the, in Fresnay's work and in the growth model perspective as well. Um, um, it's neutralized, it's more or less taken for granted that there is an agreement on growth and once the agreement on, on, on growth is found, the questions of institutions and policies are more or less depending on that. Um, fourth problem, the problem that uh, there is a very strong economic determinism in this, uh, in, in this uh, um, uh, settled. Um, of course, agents uh, define their behavior uh, with respect to single economic constraints, namely growth. So all their actions must be compatible with this objective, at least once an equilibrium has been found. Uh, otherwise, of course, there wouldn't be a growth model and there wouldn't even be a common stake, I suppose, so that would make the whole notion irrelevant. In a recent contribution of the growth model perspective, which is interesting uh, by other um, uh, aspects anyway, uh, it's very clear that they have chosen, uh, and it's a quote, growth and employment uh, uh, are the main concerns of governments because they are the key variables for electoral success. And then you may ask yourself, is it Nordhaus uh, 1975's business cycle uh, with, without even the police trade-off that would exist in, in Nordhaus's model between uh, inflation and, and uh, unemployment? There is not even policy trade-off. Everybody should be, you know, ev everybody's happy about growth and growth is, is uh, ac actually the, uh, the, the key to, to electoral success. Even empirically, this could be actually argued that uh, it's not always true and it's not even often true, but, um, um, you know, even from a theoretical point of view, I think this is a problem. I think this is a step back from even mainstream business, political business cycle theory, such as Nordhaus's uh, contribution. And by the way, since they wanted to build bridges with post Keynesians and, and Kaletskians, and uh, I mean, have, have they forgotten that in Kaletsky 1943 contribution, you haven't got all agents acting in the direction of you know, maximizing growth. They all try to achieve their own uh, um, um, objectives to um, maximize their own interests. And actually the outcome of that may be you know, one thing or the other. And it's not something which is, uh, which is you know, as, as monolithic as a, a quest for growth. Finally, uh, and this is probably something which, uh, which concerns also the recent contributions to the growth model per perspective, it's that politics is not well defined. And it's, uh, of course, troublesome in, in a political economy perspective. Um, first, regarding the contributions of Michel Fresnay, uh, a regulation inspired theory was supposed to be built on the consideration of social conflict. And social conflict is sometimes mentioned uh, in, in Fresnay's work, but not taken into account rarely in, in, in the, uh, the, the concept of growth model that he actually works on. Uh, you find contestation, which is acknowledged, uh, but uh, as I say, it, it doesn't play a role except when the growth model is in crisis. But there is no theory uh, uh, of on regarding the role of social conflict uh, when the growth model is not in crisis, which is definitely a, a step back again from the contributions of regulation uh, theory. And in, in the recent contributions, or at least all those I, I've, I've been able to have a look at, uh, in the recent contributions of the growth, so-called growth model perspectives, all politics anyways is, uh, is subordinated to, to the quest for growth. Mm -hmm. 
in Fresne, uh, Fresne is, is more subtle, really, because he, he, he states every now and then that the, the main objective is often out of reach of actors' consciousness. So that the compromise is, if there is a compromise, uh, it's not a unanimous consensus. Uh, and sometimes it takes into account uh, uh, social differentiation. But I, as I've said, it really plays a role only when the model is in crisis. And it's, it's not really something which is at the core or really developed in, in, in this literature. Again, if you look at uh, the more recent contributions, no, no, most, notably, most notably those of uh, included in, in the book by Baccarat, I was mentioning uh, uh, before, uh, actually they uh, elaborate those notions of growth coalition, uh, which are aware of the requirements of the growth model. So definitely uh, it's, it's an objective which is clearly identified and which is maximized by the so-called growth coalition. And other than that, they've got an elitist perspective between an elite that would be these growth coalition and the mass that would be the electorate. Uh, so they define a growth coalition that includes, and this is a quote, first and foremost firms and employer associations and seek to project sectoral interests as coincident with the national interest. Uh, but the contours of their growth coalitions are somewhat blurred. For instance, unions may or may not be uh, in the growth coalition if their interests are in tune with the sectoral profile of the growth model and can be accommodated without impairing the latter's functionality. So this is definitely a very functionalist economic, basic economic functionalism, which uh, defines what this uh, growth coalition is about. And you could say, what about the mass? Well, uh, the mass is, is only uh, there uh, every now and then when you've got a few elections uh, taking place. And they say in their representation that elite, that you've got a difference between elite politics and mass politics, mass politics being elections. And they say that the, the two are loosely coupled in reality. Uh, uh, one thing is for sure is that it, they are loosely coupled in their conceptual framework. So conclusion, uh, concluding on this, um, the current growth model perspective in political economy, actually consciously or not, I don't know, actually takes up the approach that was developed more thoroughly, I would say, uh, uh, the contribution of Michel Fresne. So sometimes that just presents a very simplified version of what Fresne has been, had been working on, on for, a, for a few years. Fresno's approach is marked by its origins in these kind of productive models, uh, uh, the micro meso uh, uh, level. Uh, so you could you could argue that it is as as VOC as varieties of capitalism. It's yet another firm based approach in a way. Uh, so you could say that the central elements, for instance, of the French regulation theory, such as conflict, institutionalized compromises, and so on, those are not really uh, integrated or properly integrated into this notion of growth model. I've said Michel Fresnay was very uh, honest intellectually, which is definitely true. So in, in, his, in his contributions, you, you find uh, remarks saying, yes, I'm conscious of the problem. Uh, he, he was conscious of the problem, but he had no solutions for these problems. Um, so um, another question, which is a question maybe for, um, for um, um, the sociology of science, which is uh, how come ideas that have been around uh, uh, for, I don't know, four or five decades, like, you know, um, uh, consumption based model, export led model, and so on and so forth. How can these ideas uh, be taken to uh, found a rethinking of comparative political economy or to transform political economy? Uh, my idea is that uh, actually uh, those are old ideas and they are used in the current literature mostly in a descriptive way uh, without a proper incorporation of, for instance, the theoretical apparatus of economic theories, such as post keynesian theory, uh, for instance. So uh, I think that those ideas, uh, if they are not properly renewed or rethought, uh, have reached a, a zone of diminishing returns, uh, indeed. Um, so the, the rhetorical question would be, uh, can, can the growth model uh, perspective be seriously taken to transform or renew political economy? I suppose you can gather uh, the answer to, to that. The only uh, new thing uh, which the recent growth model perspective is adding is the consideration of the political elements, but um, I, I've, I've argued, although briefly, that I think it's not a very good job which is, uh, which is done. 
Uh, I think the articulation that they do between the elite politics and mass politics is very awkward, and it's more a reflection of an academic strategy, because actually in political science, you've got two sides. You've got one side in, in, in insisting on uh, elite politics and the other one, the other side insisting on mass politics. So they probably try to actually make friends with uh, both sides. Uh, but I don't think it may be an, a clever academic strategy, but I don't think it's a very wise conceptual choice. I think the crude economic determinism growth being this all, you know, this all important determinant, I think this is not something which is particularly interesting for a political economy approach. And I think that they neglect something which is important in political economy, which is the autonomy of the, of, of the political, which, why I, which is why I think that this, uh, there is not much, uh, not really a future in, in this so-called uh, growth model perspective, uh, at least in, in the ambition, regarding the ambition to renew, rethink or transform political economy. And I will stop here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation. And we now move to Eckhard Sein next presentation.